maybe we should start with a little cartoon. So up on the screen, you'll notice a Mother's Day cartoon. Am I a good mother, Susan? My name's Amy. <laughs> Turn your Bibles to Genesis 3. How many of us, honestly, as parents, have forgotten our children's names? Yes, it's, it's happened to every single one of us, right? That doesn't mean you're a bad parent. And uh, so Mother's Day, as, as Doug mentioned, difficult time as we journey through um, losing people in our lives, and, and mothers especially. I have lost two mothers, and last year we lost another mo mother in our family. And again, it makes this day that much more uh, sensitive. And my mom died when I was 15. She was 39 years of age, Susan Morgan. I actually went to her grave site the other day, and I hadn't been there in years. I felt like a horrible son because I couldn't find where she was buried. I had to go to the office and ask them, like, can you tell me where my mom was buried? Because I haven't been here in so long. And yet, the, the truth is, she's not there. Uh, that's the reality of it. My mom loved Jesus at a, at a young age. Um, uh, her Barry Manilow box wine parties turned into Bible studies in the 80s. And uh, I saw a transformation take place in their lives. And my mom died of a very aggressive brain tumor. Two months. She was diagnosed. Two months later, she was dead. And I remember as a 15-year-old, I was the oldest of three kids, there were moments when my mom was at, at home and uh, we couldn't really, you know, afford hospice care. And I was helping my mom go to the restroom. She had lost all faculty and functioning of her body. And I just was, in my mind, I was two months old in Jesus. I was a young believer. And in my mind, I'm going, this is just not right. There's something wrong with this. And Boy, if, if Grief Share was around when I had lost my mom, see, that's one of the things that I didn't have a chance to process this loss, and I didn't have a time to process the grief. And, and I'm sure there's stuff that comes out that manifests itself even today that maybe I didn't really process as a, as a young believer, losing a mom at that age. And then it was about seven years ago we lost Lori's mom to colorectal cancer. So my mom, brain cancer, her mom, colorectal cancer, saw this woman journey with Jesus through this difficult valley for, for several years. And here's a woman who, who died well. You know, we were with her and just to watch her, and even in those final moments for the family to be together at her bedside as she took her last breath here and her first breath in eternity, um, there, there was something hopeful about the moment, but that still didn't take away the fact that we just sat there and went, this is not right. There is something wrong with this whole process. And then last year, my sister and my brother-in-law, he lost his mother to cancer as well. So we buried another mom last year. And, uh, and again, the, the thought goes through our minds, and we all have felt it probably to some degree or another. This is not the way it is supposed to be. We realize that whether we've lost someone up close and personally, whether we've seen uh, someone journey through these seasons of grief from a distance, whether we just recognize things going on in our world where we know innately that this is not the way God had originally created it, you're right. Things are not the way they should be. And cancer happens and battles and wars take place and there's this thing called sin that seems to be uh, ravishing every single heart and mind and soul around us. And we just sit there and cry out to God, how come things are like this? And yet, sometimes we don't have answers. Sometimes God doesn't give us explanations. And if you've been with us for any amount of time, you'll, you'll know that one of my favorite statements is this. While God may never give you an explanation, he will always give you himself. And that is an important truth to remember. Especially as we navigate Genesis 3. So we're in Genesis 3. Turn your Bibles and thank you for your patience as we've explored the topics of masculinity and femininity and marriage and the role of husband and role of wife. And I didn't get any nasty letters or emails from you guys, so thank you. I think probably I, I addressed some things correctly, and uh, a blind school gets a, a, a nut every once in a while, so praise God for that. Um, but we're here, and we're going back to Genesis 3, and we're going to reinstitute our study of this important book, these first 11 chapters of Genesis. If you understand Genesis 1 through 11, you're going to understand 
uh, yourself. You're going to understand uh, life. You're going to understand the world. If you don't understand Genesis 1 through 11, you're going to miss out on understanding a lot of things. And this chapter that we're going to look at and begin journeying through this morning is so important to, to understand. Because it's here that we have the famous fall of humankind. It is in Genesis 3 that now the Bible takes on a whole different tone. As a matter of fact, Genesis 3 through Revelation 21 is what God wants to get our attention with. Because now there is a conflict introduced into what God has created and he labeled very good. Now there's conflict. There's a war now between God and Satan. There's a conflict between good and evil. There's a conflict between righteousness and unrighteousness. And if we understand Genesis 3, we're going to begin to make sense of the world we live in. And more importantly, the heart that dwells within each and every one of us. So turn to Genesis 3. Let's look at the first seven verses this morning. And while we may not answer every question that probably I would love to have uh, to answer this morning, we're going to continue this dialogue in the, in, the, in the weeks to come because Genesis 3 is so, so important. So we look at Genesis 3, starting at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and had made themselves loin coverings. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. This chapter is so important. These verses are so important. Why? Because it gives an explanation of why we are where we're at, and it ultimately points to an answer, the cure for how do we take care of this disease that has now ransacked every human life that has come into the world. Four major points we're going to look at this morning. The first, and it's brought to you by the letter S. So the first point is the scheming of Satan or the serpent. Now, verse 1 is interesting because there's a lot of things that we have learned that aren't necessarily true of this verse. What we, what we don't see in Genesis 3.1 is that a snake started talking to Eve. That's not what it says. Nor are we to think that all of a sudden some reptile slithered into the garden and propped itself up and started carrying on a conversation with Eve. That's not what it says. What you have is the introduction of a character we have not been introduced to yet. And he is called the serpent. Now, this goes right in line with other teachings of the serpent who we also know as Lucifer, who we also know as Satan, or as the church lady used to say, Satan, Uh, the adversary, the lion, the murderer, the liar. He goes by a lot of different names. But it doesn't say that Satan took over the body of a snake and started talking to Eve. That's not what it says. It just says there is a being in God's created world who's known as the serpent, And he makes his appearance to Eve and starts talking to her. The word literally means, and if you want to write in your Bible, or if you're taking really good notes, literally the word serpent here means the one who is shining. There is one whose brilliance is so 
bright and shining that he makes his appearance. And Eve obviously doesn't think anything of it. I mean, they're surrounded by all that God has created, and perhaps there's something that she missed. And all of a sudden, the shining one makes his appearance. And he makes his appearance in a way that is true to his nature, and that's why we use the word scheming. Because he is crafty. Because he is using subtlety to try to bring deception. See, what happens between verse 25 of chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, you can write in your Bible between these chapters is what we would call the fall of Satan. It's spoken of through Scripture. Ezekiel chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 14, Luke chapter 10, just to name a few passages. There was one who was created in God's order of the heavenlies, even before anything on this earth was ever created. A hierarchy of angels in the angelic realm, and Lucifer, Satan, the serpent, the shining one, was given this place of authority. And yet he did not like his position that was designated to him, so he rebelled against God. And let me just tell you, for anyone that chooses to rebel against God, that is a game you will never win. Resistance is futile. And Ezekiel and Isaiah talk about the fall of Satan. And even Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven in Luke chapter 10. Because Satan, Lucifer, this beautiful angel, chose to exalt himself, i.e. pride, and lift himself to a place not only equal with God, but superior than God, he was found to be cast out. And he took a third of the angelic host with him. And there's an unseen realm, an unseen battle that is taking place that you and I, with our physical eyes, we cannot see that there is a conflict taking place. This is why Paul in Ephesians 6 says there is an unseen battle. Your battle is not against flesh and blood, but there is a war that exists against unseen forces in Ephesians 6. And so we have to understand that there is a thing called spiritual warfare. And Satan and his fallen angels that we will call demons are ones who are trying to distort God, His character, His beauty, His truth, His plan, the gospel, marriage, right? Like we've been talking about. And so what we have to understand is that here now Satan comes into the picture not to create because the enemy can't create, not to bring something new because he can't bring something new. He can only distort that which has been created. He can only twist that which God has deemed good and try to turn it into something not very good. And so Satan comes into the world, and I love how, I believe it was Tozer said, every inch of the universe is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. And what we're going to see ultimately is that there's no greater battleground for this spiritual battle than every single one of our hearts. See, my prayer and my objective is for us to understand that it is so easy to blame others and blame people and blame this and blame that. But ultimately, if we don't come to a place and understand the deceitfulness of our own hearts, you will never move towards the glory of God or the good that Jesus has for you as one who is created in his image. This is why the deceitfulness of Satan is an important place to start. Because the Bible is clear to tell us that the enemy prowls about like a roaring lion. Peter says this, and he's seeking those souls whom he may devour. Some of us have had the devouring of our souls in our past. Some of us have stories and testimonies of how we have allowed the, 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 the scheming of Satan to enter into our lives. And I'm not going to be the guy that says there's a demon behind every bush. 
I'm not so charismatic, and I'm not blaming the charismatics, but I'm going to tell you sometimes charismatics get, become charismaniacs, amen? Where they say, my car won't start today. Get thee out of my engine, Satan. Just because you have a dead battery doesn't mean we attribute it to Satan. We don't believe there's a demon behind every bush. But we must understand that the enemy is active in bringing a twisting and a distorting to God's goodness, his character, his word. And so I want to heighten our sense of spiritual warfare, but I don't want us to go crazy in blaming everything on Satan. Amen? And so we come to understand Satan, and he appears as this serpent, this shining one. And, and it's interesting how the Bible uses certain animals to attribute to certain qualities, right? The serpent, if you've ever handled a snake. I mean, snakes are freaky creatures, aren't they? Serpents are freaky animals, right? The Bible talks about wolves, right? And it's a, it's a spiritual picture of those who are greedy and, and ravenous. The picture uh, of the Bible of sheep. Isn't it funny that God uses the picture of sheep to equate to humans, right? Because sheep are kind of dumb animals, right? But he says sheep are equal to believers generally. And then there's the pigs, right? The Bible says pigs are those representative of, of unbelievers, right? Jesus cast the demons into pigs and they all jumped off the cliff, which is the first example of swine flu, if you, if you want. I'm sorry, guys. I'm here 24-7 laying down the comedy, all right? And if you didn't like that, I mean, he casts the demons into those pigs, and, you know, it's the first example of, of deviled ham. So, wait, there's more. No, there's not. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. All right, so. I know, this is bad. So Satan, John chapter 8, Jesus himself, verse 44. I think he sums it up perfectly in one verse. You are of your father the devil, and you will do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And has nothing to do with the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Notice there's two things, right? There's, there's a murderer and there's, there's deceitfulness. And what's so, so difficult in understanding the tactics of the enemy is that he doesn't come and announce himself as a murderer or one who's deceitful. All he has to do is mix a little bit of falsehood with a lot of truth, and he's got you. And all he needs to do is let you know that, oh boy, he's got the plan of life, and if you just believe the little lie, you know, it's something that's going to bring you such joy and, and wholeness, and in the end, it just kills you. And so Jesus is right on when it comes to Genesis, I mean, John chapter 8, and we need to understand that Satan's fall from grace is something that's found in Jesus' teachings. Paul describes him as an angel of light, so deceptive that perhaps even the elect could be deceived. Peter talks about him as a lion. John in Revelation talks about him as our adversary and our enemy. And so we have Satan's fall, which will ultimately lead to man's fall. And we'll unpack this some more as we continue. So there's the scheming of the serpent. Secondly, there's the simplicity of the strategy. Satan has a goal. And I would say this is, this is true for every single person that has ever lived. And there's a threefold goal that Satan has to try to woo you away from God's best, God's will, God's plan, God himself. And it consists of three things. Number one, he will try to sow within you a seed of distrusting God's love. So there's a distrust of God's love. Secondly, there's a discrediting of God's word. So he'll try to discredit God's word. And lastly, there is a distortion of God's character. Distort God's character. And I need to introduce these to you so that the third point that we're going to talk about this morning makes sense in all of our hearts. So notice the scheme of the enemy. He says in verse 1 that the Lord God had made the serpent, and he was more crafty than any beast of the field. And so he begins by a dialogue with the woman. And he says to the woman, Has God truly said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? So you notice right there 
that he's trying to make this exclusive claim that God has called, basically, you know, he's basically said, really has God said you shall uh, not eat from any tree of the garden? Which the truth is, God gave them full reign over every tree of the garden except for one. Isn't it interesting that he turns a positive, you know, protection into a negative prohibition? As if God's holding out something from you. And so if the enemy can attack God's goodness, his, his love, his benevolence, he's beginning the process of sowing within your heart the fact that, yeah, what else is God holding back from me? Is, does God really want what's best for me? How many of us have wrestled with that as we've experienced things in our lives, in circumstances in our, in our lives, where we feel like, you know what, does God really love me? Because look at verse 2. The woman responds, and, and, and I like her response. Generally, she says to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But look at verse 3. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it. But notice she adds something that's not in the original command. You shouldn't even touch it. Don't, don't we do that with God? Like, we take his, his prohibitions, we, we take his warnings, and we add stuff to them. Right? We add stuff to them. Like, you know, one of the most popular debates, you know, is like, should Christians drink alcohol, right? Is it all right to have a beer or wine, right? And there's some that total, total abstinence from alcohol, you know, that's fine. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says just don't get drunk, right? Exercise moderation, amen? And yet, we tend to add things and we tend to twist God's word and make God's word say something it never originally said. And I'm sure we can think of things like, you know, going to see R-rated movies or dancing, you know, my favorite Baptist tradition, right? Dancing or, and yet, you know, when you're hard pressed to find what does God's word say, we find silence on a lot of these topics where we learn now to exercise grace. And while there's a lot of liberty in Christ, we ought to be careful not to make it too rigid or legalistic. And here the woman adds something that was never originally in God's command. We're not only to not eat from it, we can't even touch it. And so you see, even within her response, something isn't clearly right on track. Now, you must remember, who is it that instructed the woman when it came to the the counsel of God? It was Adam. So maybe Adam wasn't totally forthright with all the information given to him. Maybe he wasn't up front with all the instructions. Perhaps he made it more rigid than it needed to be. We don't know. All we know is that she responds to the serpent with something that she's been entertaining in her heart and who knows where it came from. And then look at verse 4. And the serpent said to the woman, you're you're not going to die. A blatant contradiction of what God had said. Like, he takes the conversation now to a point where he says, Don't believe him. It is a lie. He says, you're not going to die, but you will become like him. You'll become God's. So three things happening here. Number one, there is a distrust of God's love. He can't be trusted. His generosity, he says to the woman, is, is perverted because think about how stingy he is. If he truly loved you, he'd give you access to everything. And yet he withholds one certain thing and he capitalizes on that. Has God ever held back from you a certain thing that you really, really wanted? Have you wanted something and, and you've fought with God on it where you thought, you know what, God, because you haven't given me this thing, I'm questioning your love for me. Because this is the desire of my heart. I mean, isn't it quick to pull out that psalm that says, but God's going to give you the desires of your heart. It doesn't say that. He doesn't give you everything that your, your will and your whims want and crave and desire. I mean, I remember trying to have children my wife and I journeying through infertility for, for nine plus years. 
And there were people, and there were, there were good people, but they were saying wrong things. They were saying, God told me a year from now you're going to be parents. And a year came, and a year went, and we weren't parents. And yet we had desires, but boy, say, say we banked our lives on what that person had told us, we would have a very defeated faith, wouldn't we? God never promised us children, and yet he eventually gave us children, but it was all in his timetable. But God doesn't give you everything you want. There's probably people craving a different job, and God may not give you a different job. You may crave a spouse. He may not give you a spouse. And yet what the enemy does is he finds that entrance into your heart, and he begins to sow seeds where you start to question God's love. Does he really care for me? His actions don't speak love to my life. Secondly, notice what he does then. He begins to discredit God's truth. So if God's actions are questionable, boy, what about what comes out of his mouth? Can it even be trusted? Can we even count on it? And you begin to see the distortion of God's truth. And can I tell you that the Bible is the most remarkable book in all the world. But while I say remarkable, it is also one of the most dangerous books in all the world because men and women have used the word of God in ways that have hurt people. And they've done it by twisting and distorting what the Bible means. This is why we put a premium on correct understanding and interpretation of the word of God. Because I don't want you to be misled. And I know that if we're off just a little bit, we're going to be off in greater degrees in other pieces of doctrine and theology. Say I held out a glass of water to you and I said, here's a glass of water, but I only put a little bit of acid in it. Do you, do you still want it? I mean, it looks good and, and the acid's invisible. It probably is not going to hurt you. I don't know. I haven't tried it myself, but you go ahead and try it. Would you even try it? It's, it's 95% water, but, but 5% acid. See, the dangerous thing is not blatant contradictions to God's truth. The scary thing is when God's truth is muddled with just a little bit of false teaching. Just a little bit of heresy. And we have to be careful because the enemy will distort God's word so that you're ultimately led to deny it and believe Satan's lies. And the only way to defeat Satan, I will tell you this, is with the truth of God's word. Ephesians chapter 6. The, the believer's spiritual armor, the only offensive weapon you're given in Ephesians chapter 6 is the word of God. And we must be correct handlers of the word of God. Moses said in Deuteronomy 30 that the word of God is our life. Jesus said that the word of God is our food in Matthew chapter 4. Is not the word of God important? And here's what I love being your pastor, is that we get to open the word, and we get to understand the whole counsel of the word of God, even when we don't want to hear it, even when we don't want to submit to it, but we know without the word, we are lifeless and we are empty. But with the word, we are given any, everything and we must understand that an interpretive, a correct interpretation is going to lead to life and godliness. God has given us nothing more than his word and his spirit to understand his word. Amen? And then the last point is this. It's going to distort God's character. If we don't understand God's actions as loving and generous, if we don't understand God's word as the truth, then we cannot trust his character. As a matter of fact, notice that the doctrine of divine judgment is the very first doctrine to be denied. You will not die. This is why the exclusive claim of Jesus is so difficult in our culture. He said this, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. How's that go, going with your friends? How's the exclusivity of Christ going in your conversations with people where they're, they're believing what's taught in school, right? All roads lead to heaven. All roads don't lead to heaven. All religions don't teach the same thing. If this is your first time hearing that, you, this is important. Because there's no other name under heaven by which men and women can be saved but in the name of Jesus Christ. 
There's a reason why Jesus and his life and his ministry and ultimately his death, burial, and resurrection is the greatest event in all of human history because no other religious leader claims what Jesus claimed. No other religious leader did what Jesus did. That's why the the card I got at Christmas one time from my friend who on the cover it says history is filled with men who become gods and you had pictures of, you know, um, Buddha and you had pictures of Socrates or Socrates and you had pictures of all these different people right? History is filled with men who become gods, but then you enter, open it up and it says, but only one God who become man. And there is the manger scene. Because Christianity is unique. The claims of Jesus are unique. And no other founder of any other re religion comes close to what Jesus not only said, but what he did. And so, the exclusivity of Christ is a message that is continuing to be harder to communicate to a world that wants religious pluralism. Believe whatever you want, even if it's the eight-headed blue spaghetti monster from Toronto. Go ahead and believe it. And we have to understand that when you start to question God's actions, when you start to discredit or, or distort His word, you are going to ultimately lead down a path where you don't even understand His character. And that is why these topics are so important to understand. The enemy wants you to understand God in a very ugly light. See, what we have to understand is God has created you to submit to him. He is the parent, you are the child. Last night we went to Chinese buffet. Are there two, great, are there two greater words in the human vocabulary than that? Chinese buffet. So we went to Chinese buffet. And uh, there at the table next to us was a grandfather and his two grandkids because mom and dad, they, they hooked it to the buffet. And I don't blame them, right? They're, they're loading up their plates. And there's grandpa with the two grandkids. And, and the one kid, little boy, must have been probably two. And then his little sister was probably four. And the boy started moving towards his sister. And the grandfather says, don't move towards your sister. Stay where you are. And all of a sudden, the little boy responded to his grandfather, you aren't the boss of me. And he said it just like that. And I wanted to get my like straw with like a little toothpick and be like, and like nip. just tag the kid right in the neck, right? Like you little, little silent little. And not only did he do it once, but his grandfather said, excuse me. And he said, you're not the boss of me. And as cute as that little kid was on the outside, little demon going on in his heart. That's what was going on, on the inside. And the response. And there were other patrons in the restaurant that were like, oh, because we know, like, you don't treat people in authority over you like that. Your grandparents, your parents, I don't care who it is. And yet it's the very seed of something greater where we do the same thing with God. Like, he is the divine parent, and you are his child, and you're going to tell him, don't tell me what to do? Don't tell me where to move. Don't tell me who to date. Don't tell me who I can have sex with. Don't tell me what I can drink and do with my body. Don't tell me what religion I can follow, what God I want to worship. You're going to sit there as a creation and tell the creator those things and think you're going to be okay? See, this is why this is important. Because we must learn there is a submission to understanding God's actions, his word, his character in a way that's true to what the scriptures tell us, not the manufactured deity we want to create after our own image. And that's what C.S. Lewis said. He said this, there is a God who says, I've created you in my image, and we as humans have returned the favor. We worship the God that is not the God we want. Because ultimately, if we're truthful, the God we want would not be a God of holiness and righteousness and judgment and justice and wrath. He would be the cotton candy God, right? Who, who Jesus is my boyfriend. That's you know, He just loves me. He's me. He, that's true. But he loves you at great cost. Because the holy can have nothing to do with the sinful. And praise God, he bridged that gap. And he shows us a God who is ready to remedy the problem of sin and unrighteousness and rebellion. And he's able to do it with such tenderness and kindness and grace. That there's a message out there going forth 
that would not have you believe that God is like that. This is why the enemy said, you're going to die? You're not going to die. You'll become just like him. And yet their eyes were open to the reality of something far different than what was promised them. That's why one of the fastest growing religions in the world is still Mormonism. And the promise at the heart of Mormonism is you shall become gods. In their own teaching, it says, as God, as, as man once was, God now is. And as God now is, man shall become. Bruce McConkie, one of the prophets in the Mormon church. Where does this start, this kind of thinking, this kind of belief? Right here, point number three. The stage of the struggle. The stage of the struggle. Because the line that divides good and evil runs down the, the middle of every single human heart. And I'm sure you're nice people. And I'm sure you're good people. But we are sinful people. And that sin has left us dead in our trespasses and sin. Before God, you are dead in his eyes. Not physically, but spiritually dead. Not the prince's bride theology where, oh, he's only mostly dead. There's no mostly dead. You are incapable of loving God. You are dead, and dead people cannot do anything for themselves. This is why the grace of God is so amazing. He does it for us. Right? This is why once man and woman eat of the forbidden fruit and really rebel against God, they go hide because they can't do anything else. It's God who takes the initiative and seeks after them. And we'll unpack that more next week, the whole idea of free will and what God does in saving us. But the stage of the struggle, you need to consider these words. Because look at verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave to her husband also who was with her, and he ate. You need to understand something, that when the serpent addresses Eve in the previous verses as you, she, un- she communicates it in the plural form, meaning Adam was next to her the whole time of the conversation. It wasn't like she ran and got her husband, you know, Adam, I just met this shiny creature and he promised me things that I've never heard about. And here, I've eaten the fruit. It's really good. You should try it too. No, he was there complicit in this whole event the whole time, yet totally silent. And she eats and he eats. Why? Because in their heart, they gave over to the lie. Notice verse 6 is everything that's going on inside of her heart at this moment. And I would be remiss to lead you to a New Testament version of this, which we find in James chapter 1. Check out these verses. James says this, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And then sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. What Eve struggles with and ultimately succumbs to in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, is what James describes goes on in the heart of every single human being that doesn't choose what honors God. Now notice, there's three stages here. There is the planting of desire then there's the gestation period where conception and birth takes place and then thirdly there's the the maturity and growth of something hideous and disgusting and and this is what happens we are aroused by something desirable eve in genesis 3 says that is desirable Who would not want that? And this is what the enemy does. He tries to communicate something to you that you should not want, but he does it in a way where he creates desire within you for it. And that's what ultimately sin is. Sin is wanting maybe something that's good, but achieving it in the wrong way. So here's what the enemy does. 
Really? Is it, is it really that off-putting? Is it really that disgusting? No, you really want that. And she saw it and she convinced herself, yeah, I want that. So he arouses desire. She takes, and all of a sudden, conception happens. And all of a sudden, it grows, and she passes it on to her husband. And then ultimately, it brings forth the bitter fruit of sin, which is always death. Sin leads nothing, leads, does not lead to hope. It does not lead to life. As a matter of fact, Peter echoes the same sentiment in, uh, I mean, John, 1 John chapter 2. Look what John says. He says this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So what's cool is we have James speaking to this truth. We have John speaking to this truth. Jesus echoes the same sentiment that apart from God, our hearts don't want things that are healthy and good and ultimately for God's glory. We crave things that ultimately lead to our destruction. So how can we stop this daily processing of things that are confronted, that we're confronted with? There's two types of processing. There's unbiblical processing and there's biblical processing. In your notes, notice these two things, and there's one difference. What you allow to lead you in the processing of things that you're exposed to. Unbiblical processing starts with what? It starts with emotion, and is followed by will, and lastly, the mind. See, we live in a culture, and we've all experienced this, where we're led by our feelings. Something we really, really, really want, and we're controlled by our emotions, and then our will is quickly followed up to, to support what we feel, and then our mind makes a decision but ultimately, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're led by your emotions and it's confirmed by your will, your mind has ultimately checked out at that point. This is unbiblical processing. You are never meant to live by following your emotions first. You are never meant to make decisions based upon your feelings. And yet this is what advertisers capitalize on. Right? All their TV commercials, all the magazine ads, all the little pop-ups you get on your computer. You sit there and go, oh, dog with a fluffy tail. I want it, I want it, I want it. Right? It's like when 101 Dalmatians came out. Disney released this several years ago. There was a spike in Dalmatian puppies being purchased. Because you look and they're like, you're so adorable. We to have, right? And then when those dogs grow up, people are like, we can't handle these dogs. And all of a sudden, there's Dalmatians that are in up for adoption because people acted on, oh, oh, they're so cute, but they don't stay that way. Exactly. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? Give that kid a buck. Right on, right on, right on cue. That's ultimately what it turns into. So, um, I mean, all of us in this room, I'm, we can all be adults and say, you know, we've all made decisions based upon an emotion. And we've regretted that decision. We've all been led by our feelings. And we've regretted things we have done after those feelings have. Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is deceitful. You ultimately do not know what you want. And much less if you're led by your emotions and your feelings, it is going to dictate your will, uh, will and your mind has ultimately checked out and you're not going to live for the glory of God. Yesterday, I'm at an all-day volleyball tournament with my daughter, and, and, and this was on full display. My wife got mad at me because I was yelling. I was so angry, right, of certain calls being made. And you know what? It's interesting that when the calls go against you, it's unfair. But when the calls go against the other team, you're like, right on! Right there yesterday, I'm manifesting exactly what I'm trying to tell you guys. That if, if you're emotionally invested and your feelings are there, the ball could have been out, and you are debating that it was in. Why? Because your heart has a vested interest in this thing. And yet, then they pull you aside, and, you know, if they did this in, in volleyball, they had a replay system, like, check out the video. See, it was, oh, see, hard fact, concrete truth. 
but you don't have that. So your heart just goes crazy, right? So the next call that goes against you, oh! I had to embarrass them. I, had, I, was, I made my wife embarrassed. I was embarrassed. I made my wife embarrassed, and I had to basically apologize to other team parents because she's like, you just made everyone feel so uncomfortable. And I'm like, good for them. Like, my daughter and that team, they need to win, and they're playing great, and they're getting... But you see what happened? Like, I was so caught up in the moment that, yes, your pastor perhaps lost some self-control. And they know I'm a pastor, too, which makes it harder. But you, you see the difficulty? Right? Like, I don't want my heart to become uncontrollable. I don't... I don't want the feelings and the emotions to drive my life so that now my decisions are made based upon feelings and emotions. God has not created you this way. This is why the biblical processing must happen in this order. It is mind plus your emotions that ultimately then fuel your will. We have an intellectual, reasonable faith. The gospel is never presented to someone without facts being involved. This is what's so remarkable about Christianity. It doesn't say, leave your brain at the door and just follow your emotions. It doesn't say that. It says, consider Jesus. Consider what he said. Consider what he did. Consider what he accomplished because the facts are there. There was a reporter named Lee Strobel who wrote the book Case for Christ and he even made the movie about here is an investigative journalist who is trying to prove Christianity wrong and ends up being converted in the process. Because you can't. Why? Because God says your mind must be engaged, and then what follows the mind is your heart, and then ultimately it impacts your will. This is why John 4 is such a marvelous passage on worship. We worship God in spirit and in truth. If it's all spirit, it's all emotions and feelings, and Jesus is my boyfriend. And if it's all truth, it's rigid, sterile, lifeless faith. And when you combine the mind and the heart, then it's what God wants it to be. So the way we biblically process things that you and I are confronted with is we stave off the emotions and the feelings for now, and we anchor our hearts in that which is objective, not subjective. And so we say, what does God say? If I'm not married and boy, I have a desire to have sex, do I act on that desire? No, you keep your pants on until you're committed to someone of the opposite sex in the context of marriage. Call me old school. Call me a Puritan. I'm going to point to Jesus and say, he's the one who has declared this. I want to marry someone, but they don't know Jesus. Excuse me, what? You love Jesus, they don't. Don't let these two things happen. Because I've always seen it end up in a, in a, as a train wreck. But I want to, no. you're being led by your emotions. This is why I tell young people these days who, you know, they, they've got that first love. My first, my first question is, um, do they desperately love Jesus? Well, they didn't know. You know, when they start kind of backpedaling, you know the emotions and the feelings are there. She's so cute. He's so handsome. Right? It doesn't matter. The enemy's a shiny one. He's beautiful. He masquerades as an angel of light. Why? Because his, his subtle work of deception, he's been mastering for centuries. And when it comes to your life and your temptations, he knows how to bait his hook for you. And how he baits his hook for you is different than how he baits his hook for me. And I don't know if it has to do with your sexuality. I don't know if it has, has, has to do with your work ethic. I don't know how, if it has to do with the God you worship. But whatever it is, you are not led first by your heart, your emotions, your feelings. You're first led by your mind. This is why Romans chapter 12 is such an important passage. Brothers, sisters, I urge you in view of God's mercies, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, to present yourselves as living sacrifices to God, right? Holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind by testing what is good right discern what the will of god is that which is good and acceptable and perfect 
we want what we want because we want it, and it sometimes doesn't mean it's what God wants. And with everything that you have a question about, you first take to God's word. What does your word have to say about this? What does your truth have to say about this? And it's not because God is some cosmic killjoy who doesn't want you to experience life to the, the, the best. It's because of these boundaries that he does want you to have life's best. But he doesn't want you to have life's best apart from him because any gift without the giver of those gifts is an empty life. How is your mind be renewed by God in Christ? Do you know how to take things to the word and test them? See, daily you are buying into things that are leading you away from God, not toward God. And the Bereans in Acts 17, I mean, they're an amazing group of people, right? That the apostles brought these teachings and they tested even what the apostles brought by the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is truth. The word of God reflects how good his character is and how good his actions are. And if God's word says don't do it, guess what? I don't do it no matter what my heart says. See, Eve was led astray because the arousal of desire, her emotions and her feelings wanted something that God did not want her to have. She had everything anyways at the very beginning, right? Why would she even want what God said was off limits? Because the enemy did a work in her life. And it's not the enemy's fault. It's the struggle that she succumbed to. And we're going to talk about that next week. Why did God set things up like this? What about free will? Et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about that more next week. But let's end with this. Because some moms have lunch appointments today. Amen. All right. The severity of sin. The reason why this is so important to talk about is because what happens in Genesis 3 has ruined us. It has ruined our lives as individuals. It has ruined our lives as siblings. It has ruined our lives as married couples. It has ruined our lives as parents and children. It has ruined our lives as a culture and a community. It has ruined this world. And the severity of sin says this, because of mankind's disobedience at the very beginning, we are all plunged headlong into sin, and there's nothing we can do to correct the situation for ourselves. Romans chapter 5. As sin has entered the human race through one man, Adam, here's the good news. Salvation has come through the second Adam, Jesus, to those who would believe. See, what, what, what the woman is guilty of is unbelief. What the man is guilty of in this context? Rebellion. You have to understand, God doesn't hold the woman responsible. In the end, Adam is responsible. She is unbelieving, but he is outright rebellious. And this is why the Bible points to Adam as the one who introduces sin to the human race, and now we're not the same. Look at verse 7. And the eyes of both of them were open, and now they are naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. We have not even gone seven verses from when they were naked and not ashamed at the end of chapter 2, now to the fact that they are guilty and estranged from the very one who has created them. You see what a mess we make of things? <laughs> we're not even eight, seven verses in, and they've, they've messed it up. And ruined us all. Now, what is the extent of that ruin? We will talk about next week. But pride has now been introduced to the human race. And I will tell you, like C.S. Lewis said, it is the mother hen of all sins. Jonathan Edwards said, it is the first sin introduced to the human race, and it will be the last one uprooted. But not only that, there's an element of covetousness here too, right? Is that not one of the Ten Commandments? And yet all the other nine commandments come out of covetousness, wanting something that God says you need to guard your heart and say, I don't need that. So there's powerful forces at work. Praise God, there's an even more powerful force. His name is God at work in Jesus to save us from our despicable state. Happy Mother's Day. I mean, is there not a greater message, folks? 
And I want you to leave with that thought. While God is father, he is also mother because the Bible portrays him as a mother hen who protects her chicks. And there's a mothering love and influence that God the Father shows us and that he is tender. This is why man, woman reflect the image of God. You need to know that there's a God who loves you more than you can ever imagine. He accepts you warts and all and he wants to dote you with his love through Christ. But he's not going to give you anything outside of Christ. It's all in Jesus. And that's the best news I can give you guys. As much as we are, we are building a picture that may not be the one we want to hear, it's the one we need to hear. Because God is good. He has conquered the work of the enemy. He has conquered the power of sin. He has overcome the power of death. And we have one who is more than a conqueror, and his name is Jesus Christ. And all who are in him have life and hope and health. And that's what I want for every single one of you. So the conversation will continue next week. Amen? How are we doing on time? Are we good? Are we good? Anything you would add? Anything? No? Okay. Good. Because I know we're not talking about marriage, but you're still allowed to speak to this, to this topic. So <laughs> let's stand. Let's pray. Love you guys. And again, thankful for all you mothers out there. And for those of you who are moms that have raised a brood of children, and have done well, praise God. For those of you who are moms that maybe have children that are not seeking the heart of God, I pray for you. I can't even imagine how difficult that is. For those of you who are women who have desired children and maybe can't have children for one, we can relate with that struggle. Um, wherever you may be on the motherhood spectrum, you are loved and you are appreciated. We are so thankful for you. So, happy Mother's Day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us for this morning, for this time as a family, for the conversation that centers around something so important. Father, I pray that you would sow your seeds of truth in our hearts so that we would truly know your actions, your word, your character is, is trustworthy. That in Christ we have everything we could ever want and that outside of Jesus there's nothing that we need. So Lord, help us with your power and your spirit to tame our hearts, to want what you want, to desire what you desire. Father, thank you for loving us in Jesus, for giving us this day and for the moms, for the women here. May they feel loved, may they feel appreciated, even beyond today, Lord. May you instill within their lives that inner voice that says, well done. Well done loving a husband, well done loving your children, well done just caring for other people, Lord. Thankful for the women and for the mothers here in this place today. Let us have a great day. Let us walk in your spirit. Bring glory to you in all we do and say. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for hanging out with us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.